everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. In this video we're going through everything for OCR module 4, biodiversity, evolution and disease. It is a long video so if you want to skip ahead to any of the particular parts in this topic then have a look at the time codes below and if you do need more help speeding up your revision and improving your knowledge of the key marking points then don't forget to check out my OCRA notes which I'll link in the description below and you can see a taster of just here but for now let's get into it. Within topic 4 there are three key areas that we're going to be going through and we're starting with communicable diseases, disease prevention and the immune system. Communicable diseases are caused by pathogens and this includes bacteria, viruses, protoctista and fungi and pathogens can cause harm through directly damaging tissue or through the release of toxins and for each type of pathogen these are the examples of diseases that they cause that you need to know for the OCRA 2025 spec. And we're going to go through each of these in a bit more detail. So the first disease we're looking at is a bacterial disease and it's caused by the pathogen bacteria and it's tuberculosis. It can infect humans, deer, cows, pigs and badgers. It's transmitted through airborne droplets and it's more prevalent where people live in cramped conditions because of that mode of transmission. It causes harm by damaging lung tissue and suppressing the immune system, but it can be cured using antibiotics because it's caused by bacteria, and it can also be prevented through vaccination. The next bacterial disease is ring rot, and this infects potatoes, tomatoes, and aubergines. It's a bacteria that damages the leaves and tubers and the fruit, as we can see here on this tomato. It's transmitted through infected tubers and micropropagation of plantlets from the infected plants. And it reduces the crop of the plant and it affects the livelihood of farmers, which is why it's an issue, because that means it's going to impact their profit, but also food supplies for humans. Next, let me look at viruses. Viruses are classed as non-living and acellular, meaning they're not made up of cells. They are smaller than bacteria in size and they are acellular and they simply consist of genetic material, which is either DNA or RNA, a capsid and attachment proteins. And a capsid is a layer of protein surrounding the genetic material. Viral replication occurs inside of host cells. So a virus can't replicate unless it is inside of a host cell. And this involves the injection of their genetic material, the nucleic acid, into the host cell. Bacteriophage are an example of a virus that infects bacteria. So viral diseases then, the first one is HIV and this can lead to AIDS. HIV or the human immunodeficiency virus is transported around in the blood until it attaches to a protein, which is a receptor on helper T cells, which are a type of white blood cell. HIV positive describes when someone, so a human, is infected with that HIV, so the human immunodeficiency virus. AIDS, though, is when the replicating virus in those helper T cells interferes with the normal functioning of the immune system. So if you're HIV positive, that doesn't mean you will develop AIDS, but it means you could develop AIDS if enough helper T cells are destroyed. With the helper T cells being destroyed by the virus, that is what makes the host, so the human, unable to produce that adequate immune response to other pathogens. And that's why if you do have AIDS, you are left vulnerable to other infections and even cancer. So you wouldn't die directly from AIDS, but you would die from the consequences of it, which is your immune system isn't functioning properly. And HIV is transmitted through direct contact through the sharing or mixing of bodily fluids. Another viral disease you need to know is influenza. And influenza viruses infect the ciliated cells that lie in the gas exchange surfaces. Young children and elderly people or anyone with a lowered immune system are at higher risk of having severe symptoms or even actually dying from influenza, which is also known as the flu. It's transmitted by airborne droplets. So when you cough or sneeze, you're releasing these airborne droplets. And if someone else inhales those, then they could become infected with that virus. Next, then we've got tobacco mosaic virus, and this infects plants and mainly tobacco plants, but not exclusively tobacco plants. It causes damage to the leaves, resulting in a mosaic pattern on them. It damages the flowers and the fruits as well. 
and this damage prevents the plant from growing properly. It can be transmitted when infected leaves touch healthy leaves or if gardeners use contaminated tools. There isn't actually a cure, but resistant strains have been developed. The next type of pathogen then is the protoctista or the protista. And these are examples of eukaryotic cells that exist as single celled organisms, or the cells can be grouped together into colonies. There are very few protoctista that are pathogenic, but the few that are cause extremely dangerous symptoms to the host that they infect. So these pathogenic protoctista are parasites and they are usually transmitted via a vector. So a common example is malaria, which is the parasite, the protoctista, and that's transmitted by the vector mosquitoes. So if we have a look then at malaria in more detail, it's caused by plasmodium and it's spread to humans through mosquitoes. So plasmodium is the name of those protoctista and the vectors are the mosquitoes. Plasmodium reproduces both sexually and asexually within the mosquitoes and also within the human hosts that they infect. They can be passed from mosquitoes to humans where mosquitoes bite and take blood from the human. In humans, the plasmodium infects red blood cells and the liver and the brain. There are some preventative medicines that you can take, but there isn't a vaccine and there isn't a cure. The next disease then is potato blight. This is another protoctista caused by a fungus-like protoctista and it causes potato blight or tomato late blight. It has hyphae which enter the plant and that is what causes damage to the leaves and the fruit of the plant. It's transmitted by spores which travel on the wind or they can be transferred by animals and insects from one plant to another plant. There isn't a cure, but again, you can develop resistant strains against this disease. Fungi are our next example, and these are eukaryotic organisms that can cause plant diseases. They can either be multicellular fungi or single cell fungi. Pathogenic fungi are parasitic and they release enzymes which digests the host tissues. And that could be animals or plants, it's just that many of them cause plant diseases. So the first fungal plant disease is black cigatoka and this infects bananas. The fungal hyphae are what causes damage to the leaves, causing them to turn this black colour and it prevents plant growth because it's going to be preventing photosynthesis. It's transmitted by spores from one plant to the next through the wind. Fungicides can kill the fungus and also there are some resistant strains that have been developed. Next, I'm going to look at athlete's foot, which is an example of a fungal disease infecting animals, specifically humans. It's a type of ringworm and it thrives in warm, damp regions, such as between your toes. And it causes the skin to crack and to become scaly, causing your skin to be really itchy and sore. It's transmitted by direct contact, so for example, wearing the same socks or shoes as an infected person, and it can be cured using antifungal creams. So the next thing you need to know is how these different pathogens are transmitted, and certain living conditions can make transmission more likely. For example, hot climates, and that's because that increased temperature provides more kinetic energy for chemical reactions, and therefore the pathogens will be reproducing faster. Social factors can also have an impact, and by that we mean potentially areas where there is poverty or developing countries. And that is because in poorer areas there might be uh, fewer sewage infrastructures, a lack of fresh water, lack of fresh food, maybe poor sanitation. There might be overcrowding as well, which will increase the spread. It might also be the fact that medicines and vaccines are less readily available to prevent and treat the pathogens, which would then result in the preventing of the spreading. So the types of transmission are either direct or indirect. And I recommend for this slide, you create a set of flashcards because this would be really useful to have direct transmission is direct contact, inoculation, ingestion, and then another flashcard, indirect transmission, vectors, droplets, fomites. But I'd also suggest to have an extra six flashcards one that just says direct contact and then on the other side your example so touching kissing contact with cuts skin and sexual contact 
inoculation and then on the other side animal bites sharing needles and cuts in the skin and the same idea for the other examples and this is just set information that you just need to learn so those are your modes of transmission in animals but you also need to know the modes of transmission in plants which again can be direct or indirect so also create a set of flashcards and make sure you're emphasizing whether it's plants or animal transmission just to make you aware for the OCR 2025 spec, you no longer have to be able to split these in between what is an example of direct or indirect transmission. So you don't need to know that, but these are all really useful examples to know. So I've decided to still keep it in to this video. So then we move on to the responses that animals and plants have to try and defend themselves against these pathogens. Now, plants don't have blood or an immune system, but what they do have is barriers to prevent entry. So that is bark and waxy cuticles. They produce antibacterial chemicals and proteins, which act as a defense against bacterial infections. And they can actually repel insects, which are the vectors often, and kill pathogens. So, for example, this here is showing you witch hazel. That's a particular chemical that can kill pathogens. They also have physical defenses to prevent pathogens from spreading between their cells once they become infected. And that's what a callus is. Animal responses. There are primary and secondary lines of defense that occur against pathogens. The primary line of defense is the first one, and it's non-specific, meaning the same response will happen regardless of the pathogen. And these include, first of all, the skin. The skin is a physical barrier and it contains skin flora, which are microorganisms that provide a benefit to humans and they can outcompete the pathogenic bacteria. Blood clots will form if there is a cut to that skin barrier and that produces a new temporary barrier to prevent pathogens from entering. There are mucous membranes that line many body tracts and those are able to produce mucus, which is a thick, sticky substance that the pathogens would get trapped in. And then ciliated cells, the cilia, which are the hair-like structures, would sweep that mucus up and out so it would be removed from the body. Lysozymes are hydrolytic enzymes and they digest pathogens. And we have lysozymes in our tears, but also inside of phagocytes, which we're gonna come on to, what sneezing, coughing, and vomiting are. So these are mechanisms that force the pathogens out of the body. Inflammation, which we can see here up in these toes, it occurs in a localized area where damage to cells is detected. It causes the area to become really red, hot, sore, itchy, and swollen. And that is because when the cells are damaged, it triggers mast cells to release this chemical histamines and cytokines. And the histamines cause the blood vessels in that area to dilate. And therefore you have much more blood flow into the area. And that's why it looks red and it feels hotter. The increased temperature from that increased blood flow is what kills the pathogens. Now the histamines also make the walls of the blood vessels more permeable. And if it's more permeable, that means the white blood cells from the blood are able to leave the blood vessels and go to the site of the damage and destroy any pathogens that might be present. Lastly, those cytokines, they attract the phagocytes and those can engulf and destroy the pathogens. So phagocytosis is an example of the first line of defense. And this is done by white blood cells called phagocytes. And phagocytes could be macrophages or neutrophils. And these travel in the blood and they can squeeze out of the capillaries to engulf and digest pathogens. And in that way, they destroy them. And this is non-specific, meaning this will happen in the same way for all pathogens. So here's the process of what happens, which we can see happening in the diagram. Damaged cells and pathogens release cell signaling chemicals, which are the cytokines and cytokines can attract phagocytes and therefore the phagocytes come to the site of the infection. An opsonin protein can attach to pathogens to mark them and make it easier for the neutrophils and macrophages to engulf the pathogen. Phagocytes have receptors which can attach onto chemicals on the surface of the pathogen and then the phagocyte changes shape to engulf and surround the pathogen and it puts it in a vesicle known as a phagosome. Within the phagocytes, there are lysosomes, which contain lysozymes, 
and those lysosomes will fuse with the phagosome to make a phagolysosome. Now, once they fuse, the lysosomes are exposed to the pathogen. And these are digestive enzymes that hydrolyze the pathogen. And once that pathogen has been hydrolyzed, any useful soluble molecules are absorbed into the cytoplasm of the phagocyte to be used. But it will also present the antigen on the surface of the phagocyte itself, and it's then known as an antigen presenting cell. So we then move on to the second line of defense. So this is if the none of those first lines of defense have actually stopped the pathogen from getting in or destroyed the pathogen. Then the second line of defense will be occurring. And this is specific and it will respond to particular shaped antigens. There are two types of lymphocytes that are involved in this response. We have B lymphocytes or B cells and T lymphocytes or T cells. And all of these lymphocytes are made in the bone marrow coming from the stem cells. But the reason they're called B and T is after where those cells mature. So B cells are made in the bone marrow and then they continue to mature in the bone marrow. Whereas T cells are made in the bone marrow, but then they go to the thymus to mature. And that's why they're called T cells. And we're going to start with the T cells, which are responsible for the cell mediated response. So receptors on the T cells will bind to the antigens on antigen presenting cells. And that's because of complementary shapes. This will cause the T cell to divide rapidly by mitosis. And we call that clonal expansion because mitosis creates identical cells and because they're replicating, we get lots of them. So they're expanding in numbers. Now, antigen presenting cells are cells that present a non self antigen on their surface. And this could include an infected body cell, which presents the viral antigen on their surface. It could be the example we just talked about in phagocytosis a macrophage which has already engulfed and destroyed a pathogen which then presents the antigen on its surface. It could also be cells of a transplanted organ because they will have slightly different shaped antigens on their surface compared to your own self-cell antigens. Cancer cells will also have abnormal shaped self-antigens so it could trigger this response. So T cells could respond to any of these types of cells by binding to a complementary shaped antigen. So we're going to look through this whole process then of the cell mediated response. So we've got once the pathogen has been engulfed and destroyed in phagocytosis by the phagocyte, we said that that phagocyte will put the antigen on its surface and become an antigen presenting cell. So this is where phagocytosis leads into the specific line of defense. The T helper cells have receptors on their surface, which we can see just here. And those can attach to complementary shaped antigens on antigen presenting cells, such as a phagocyte. Once it's attached, interleukins are produced and that will activate the T helper cells to divide by mitosis. So that's where we were talking about that clonal expansion. So they'll then replicate and make large numbers of clones. The clone T helper cells then differentiate into different cells that are needed. So some of those T helper cells will remain as T helper cells and they'll produce interleukins to activate the B lymphocytes. Some will produce interleukins to stimulate macrophages to perform more phagocytosis as well. We also get T memory cells and these are T cells that will retain that particular shape receptor for that antigen in case of reinfection. We then have T killer cells or cytotoxic T cells. And we'll go through those in a bit more detail on the next slide. Lastly, we have T regulator cells, which suppress the immune response to ensure that the cell mediated response only occurs when the pathogens are detected. So a bit more detail then on the T killer cells, because as the name suggests, these are the T cells that can destroy abnormal or infected cells that have those antigens on their surface. And the way they do this is releasing a protein called perforin, and this protein embeds in the cell surface membrane and makes a pore. And that's what we can see here, lots of these pores being created by the protein embedding into the cell surface membrane. Now, what that can do is either cause lots of substances to leave the cell and therefore it dries out and it kills it, 
or it can cause lots of water to enter the cell and therefore it will lice and burst. Now this is most common in viral infections because viruses infect body cells. So body cells have to be destroyed and sacrificed to prevent the virus being able to replicate and cause any further damage. So next we move on to the role of the B cells, the B lymphocytes, and they are involved in the humoral response. So the T helper cells we just said, in the cell mediated response, some of the T helper cells will release interleukins, which stimulate the B cells. And that's what initiates the humoral response. And this is the response that involves antibodies. So let's just have a little look at what an antibody is. It's a globular quaternary structure protein, and it actually has four polypeptide chains. We can see these two shorter ones, which are the light chains. And then we have these two longer ones, which are the heavy chains. The bit highlighted in yellow is known as the variable region because it varies in every antigen. So this is the bit which has the unique 3D shape which will be complementary in shape to a particular antigen. The rest of the antibody, which is shown in blue, is the constant region, because that will be the same shape in every antigen. And when an antigen and antibody bind, we call it an antigen-antibody complex. Finally, you have this hinge region on antibodies, and that's what makes them flexible, so they can bind to multiple pathogens. So the way that antibodies can actually help to destroy the pathogen are in three ways. Agglutination, marking pathogens, and also acting as an antitoxin. Agglutination is what we can see here in this image. It's where we have the clumping together of the pathogens due to the antibodies binding to them. And in clumping them together, it makes it easier for the phagocytes to locate and engulf them more efficiently and therefore you'll be removing the pathogen before it can cause too much damage. Antibodies also act as opsonin when an antibody antigen complex has been formed. The antibodies are therefore marking the antigen, making them more susceptible for phagocytosis. Lastly, antibodies can bind to toxins that are being produced by the pathogen, and that will prevent the toxin from entering the cell and causing any harm. And that is why it'd be classed as an antitoxin. So then if we have a look at the process of the humoral response and how these antibodies are produced, we need to first of all link it to the cell mediated response because those activated T helper cells, they will actually bind to a B cell. So here we have an activated T lymphocyte. Some have gone on to be killer cells, but some will then bind to the B lymphocytes to activate the B lymphocytes. And this is only possible if the B lymphocyte has a complementary shape to the receptor on the helper T cell. And this is known as clonal selection because complementary receptor on the outside, and that is what indicates which antibody will be produced and it ensures it will be an antibody complementary in shape to the antigen. So once the B cells have been selected correctly for clonal selection, that B cell is then activated by the release of interleukin chemicals from the T helper cell. That causes the B cells to rapidly divide by mitosis to make clones, and those clones then differentiate into either memory B cells, which we can see down here, or into plasma cells. So this stage is clonal expansion. The plasma cells are responsible for making the antibodies and those antibodies can then go on to do one of those three roles that we discussed in the previous slide. Now that is what happens in the primary immune response and that means the first time you have ever been infected with this particular pathogen or antigen. The memory B cells are going to be reserved for if you are reinfected and if you are reinfected with the same pathogen at a later date, those B memory cells remain in the blood. And if they collide with that antigen, they can rapidly divide into plasma cells and therefore produce large amounts of antibodies very, very quickly to destroy the pathogen before you should get any symptoms. So if we think about this primary and secondary immune response in a bit more detail, the primary response is your first exposure to a pathogen. 
And because it's the first time you've been exposed, you don't have any memory B cells. So it can take a few days for the lymphocytes to create enough of the complementary antibodies to destroy the pathogen. And therefore you do get ill because the pathogen starts to cause damage and that's what the symptoms are that you're getting. However, a secondary immune response is when you are reinfected with the same pathogen and you have B memory cells. And as soon as those collide and bind with a complementary shaped antigen to their receptor, they can differentiate into the plasma cells and make large amounts of antibodies rapidly. So the pathogen gets destroyed before it can cause any damage or minimal damage, and therefore you won't have any symptoms or you'll have very minimal symptoms. Now this is known as active immunity because you are immune because you were actively reinfected before. So we're gonna have a look at the two key different types of immunity, passive and active. Passive immunity is when antibodies are introduced into the body rather than you making them yourself. The pathogen doesn't enter the body, so that means plasma cells and memory cells are not made, and therefore you don't have any long-term immunity to this pathogen. Examples are either natural or artificial. Natural passive immunity is when antibodies can be passed to a fetus, and that could be through the placenta from the mother to the fetus, or through breast milk from the mother to the baby. Artificial passive immunity is when you have a transfusion or injection of antibodies as part of a medical treatment of a disease, so for example, hepatitis B. In contrast, active immunity is when immunity is created by your own immune system, and that's after you've been exposed to the pathogen or its antigens. And there's two types of this, again, natural or artificial. Natural active immunity is when you are now immune due to previously being infected by that pathogen. So you've now created these memory cells due to natural exposure. Artificial active immunity is following the introduction of either a weakened version of the pathogen or antigens via a vaccine. You have now been exposed to the pathogen or antigens, made your own memory cells, and now you are immune. And this leads us into the types of immunity that exist. Passive immunity is when antibodies are introduced directly into you. So the pathogen itself doesn't enter your body, so no plasma cells or memory cells have been made and therefore you don't have any long-term immunity, it's just temporary. And an example of this is antibodies passed to the fetus through the placenta or to babies through breast milk. Active immunity involves you being exposed to the pathogen or the antigen, so that means your body has made plasma cells and memory B cells and you do have long-term immunity. There are two types of active immunity, either natural or artificial. Natural is when you have been infected and you've created memory cells. Active is through the introduction of a weakened version of the pathogen or the antigen through a vaccine. So the whole of the second line of defense is due to cell recognition. So being able to recognize cells that are not your own body cells. And that is because cells are labeled with proteins to enable this recognition. And this is what prevents your lymphocytes from destroying your own body cells because all of your body cells are labeled with a unique shaped protein, so an antigen, that your lymphocytes recognize as self cells. So any other type of antigen, so protein, detected on the surface of a cell is recognized as non-self and that is then what triggers the immune response to destroy that cell. That could be an abnormal body cell for example, cancer, because the antigens on the outside of cancer cells change and therefore they get detected as non-self. It could be toxins produced by pathogens. It could be pathogens themselves, cells from other organisms, so a transplant. And an antigen is typically a protein molecule on the cell surface membrane of non-self cells. The presence of that antigen is what triggers the immune response and the production of antibodies. So next we have a look at autoimmune diseases and this is when your immune system identifies your own body cells as non-self and therefore assumes they're pathogens and potentially harmful. 
the body recognizes antigens on some body cells or tissues as these non-self or antigens and therefore it starts to produce antibodies against these particular antigens on those body cells. The cells are then attacked and damaged and it causes the symptoms of the disease. Sometimes the immune system responds abnormally to healthy or good microorganisms within, within the body as well, or it can overreact to mild pathogens. Other times the T regulator cells don't work properly, so the immune response isn't regulated. So that means it's always a heightened response um, of this immune response. An example is rheumatoid arthritis that you need to know about. So in this example, the immune system attacks the cartilage in joints. This can cause inflammation and pain in those affected joints. There isn't a cure, but anti-inflammatory drugs such as steroids and pain relief and immunosuppressant drugs can be taken to relieve the symptoms. So the next thing is looking at disease prevention. And we briefly talked about immunization or vaccine when we talked about artificial active immunity. Immunization could also be passive immunity because there are some vaccines when antibodies are directly injected into you to help destroy the pathogen. But the most common one that you'll be aware of is an artificial active immunity vaccine when antigens or small amounts of attenuated pathogen are injected into you or it can be taken orally as a liquid. These trigger a primary immune response but with very few symptoms so you shouldn't actually get ill from the vaccine itself. So that means if you are reinfected with the same pathogen you'll be able to rapidly produce antibodies which will then destroy the pathogen before you get any symptoms or you'll only get very mild symptoms and this is a secondary immune response. And in this way, vaccines provide protection for an individual, but also for entire populations against disease. Now, vaccines are not always effective in the long term, and that is why we have booster vaccines. And this is because all organisms have random mutations, including pathogens. And sometimes the random mutations that occur might result in the pathogen producing a different shaped protein on the outside, or in other words, a different shaped antigen. And if that happens, we call this antigen variability, and it means that the memory B cells that you've created will now have a receptor which is no longer complementary to this new shaped antigen, and you're no longer immune. So for that reason, there are boosters that people would have to take. And a really good example of that is the influenza or flu vaccine, there is an annual flu vaccine because we know that influenza mutates at such a rapid rate that you would need a new vaccine every year to be protected. So an epidemic is when a disease spreads rapidly on a national level. A pandemic, which I think we all know very well now, is when a disease spreads rapidly on a global level. And mass vaccination programs are designed to prevent the further spread of pathogen causing diseases. And these vaccines are frequently updated. So just like with the COVID vaccine, there have been lots of booster vaccines that you need to have. And that is to make sure you are still protected in case of antigen variability that has happened. And the idea behind vaccines is yes, it protects you as an individual, but also if a large enough proportion of the population are vaccinated, it helps to prevent the spread of the pathogen. And this is what we call herd immunity. So if most of the population are vaccinated and therefore immune, it reduces the spread of that pathogen and it means that people that are too vulnerable to have the vaccine are therefore still going to be protected because enough of the population are immune to prevent the spread of that pathogen. Now vaccines are a preventative medicine but there are also other medicines that can kill pathogens. And most of these medicines were originally sourced from microorganisms and plants. And that is one of the reasons why maintaining biodiversity is so key, because there might be other cures for diseases in microbes and plants that we haven't discovered yet. And if those plants go extinct, then we will never discover that medicine. So antibiotics is a key example. 
These are produced by microorganisms and they inhibit the growth of other microbes. Just a quick 2025 OCR edit that I've added in here to give you some more examples that you need to be aware of. So screenshot and write these down as well. So if we have a look at the importance of maintaining biodiversity, one reason is that many drugs have originated from plants and microbes. And therefore, if we maintain biodiversity, it increases the chances of us finding more drugs to treat and to cure potential diseases that we haven't found the medicines for yet. So we need to make sure we maintain that genetic resource for the future. Many modern drugs have been made using knowledge of traditional remedies, but once a species is extinct, its genetics and potential medicines would be lost forever. Now bacteria, just like all organisms, have random mutations and this has led to antibiotic resistance. So due to those random mutations that occur, there could be a mutation that occurs that codes for a new protein that provides some sort of protection against the antibiotic. And therefore the bacteria that have that mutation have the selective advantage, meaning they're more likely to survive. Now that will mean that they are more likely to survive, reproduce and pass on that mutated allele to the population. And that would then mean the whole population are resistant. And the widespread use and misuse of antibiotics is what has led to this and sped up the process. Because it's only an advantage for them to have that mutation if you are taking an antibiotic. Because that would mean the non-resistant bacteria would die and the resistant bacteria would survive and pass on that allele. So if you weren't taking antibiotics, they wouldn't be any more likely to survive and that wouldn't spread. So this mutated gene for antibiotic resistance is found in the plasmid and it's the plasmid that can be exchanged between bacteria and that is how it can spread between bacteria to bacteria and then you do create this whole resistant strain and two common resistant bacterial strains are clostridium difficile and mrsa so old medicines are the ones that we said are sourced traditionally from plants or microbes and some examples are aspirin that was from the bark of a willow tree and digioxin is from the plant and flower foxgloves Newer medicines are ideas such as personalised medicines. And it's not a new concept, but it does now link to gene technology. And it's this idea that everyone is different. So we respond differently to different medicines. And gene technologies have enabled us to work out how different people might respond to medicines. And by analysing your DNA, that means you can identify the most suitable drug for someone to have and maybe even the most suitable dose. And this is known as pharmacogenetics. Synthetic biology includes the synthetic manufacture of medicines, so including genetic engineering of insulin. It's essentially when you use cells, often bacteria cells, as medicine factories. And it combines both gene sequencing, bioinformatics, and also computational biology to find out, first of all, the base sequence of a protein, then you can store the data digitally and make 3D models and simulations before physically producing a medicine in a lab. Next, we move into biodiversity. So biodiversity is the range of living things, but there's different ways that you can classify this. There's species diversity, which is the number of different species and individuals within each species in a community. Genetic diversity is the variety of genes amongst all of the individuals in a population of one species. And habitat diversity is the range of the different habitats present. Now, species diversity can be classified even further. You could be looking at species richness, which is the number of different species in a particular area at a particular time. And again, this would be great for flashcards. You've got four definitions there to put on your flashcard. The final key term here in terms of considering biodiversity linked to species diversity is the term species evenness. And this is the relative abundance of each different species within the community. So you can actually measure genetic diversity. And this is calculated by examining polymorphic genes within isolated populations, such as zoos and captive breeding. It can also be used when you're examining rare breeds and pedigree animals, where selective breeding is also used. 
So a polymorphic gene is one that has more than one allele. And most genes within a population do only have one allele and therefore are monomorphic. But to calculate genetic diversity, you can measure polymorphism using this formula. So proportion of polymorphic gene loci, and that would be the number of polymorphic gene loci, which basically means the number of polymorphic genes, divided by the total number of loci, which means the total number of genes. And the higher the proportion of polymorphic gene loci, the larger the genetic diversity within the population. So let's take a look then at this calculation, Simpson's Index of Diversity. And it's a way to look at the biodiversity and compare them between different habitats. So here's your formula where capital N represents the total number of organisms of all species. Lowercase n is the total number of organisms of a particular species. And D, capital D, is Simpson's Diversity Index. Now the calculated value will always be between zero and one, but values closer to zero have a lower biodiversity and values closer to one have a higher biodiversity. So let's have a go at an example together. You might have this set of data. We've got four different species and we're told this is the number of each species. And we said lowercase n was the number of individuals per species and capital N is the total number. So if we add up all of those that gives us the total which is 25 and what we then need to do is the sum of lowercase n which is the number per species divided by the total number of organisms squared. So we'd need to calculate that for every species. So this here would be 6 divided by 25 squared, 3 divided by 25 squared, 12 divided by 25 squared, 4 divided by 25 squared, and then it is the sum of all of those. Once we've then done that, which in this case is 0 0.328, it's 1 minus that value, which gives us a final answer of 0 0.672. We then move on to sampling, and this is a way to measure the biodiversity of a habitat. And we use sampling because it would take far too long to literally count every individual in an area, and you probably wouldn't do it accurately. So sampling is a way to get a representative estimation of the population. But to make sure your sample is representative, you have to make sure it is a large sample and that is also going to be useful because you can then calculate a mean, do a statistical test on it, and that will tell you if any of the differences or correlations you see are significant. You should also randomly sample to avoid bias to make sure that your sample is representative. So if we go through a method of how you can randomly sample, you could lay out two tape measures at right angles, and that creates this virtual gridded area. Then use a random number generator, such as a calculator, to generate two numbers which act as coordinates. So the first number, that would be how far you go up on one tape measure. Second number is how far along you go on the other. And then you walk until you meet, and that is where you place your quadrat to take your sample. Now, it won't always actually be appropriate to do random sampling. And there are three non-random sampling techniques that can be used, which vary in terms of how accurate your results would be. So opportunistic, stratified and systematic. Opportunistic is unlikely to result in accurate data because this method involves sampling organisms which are conveniently available and therefore is biased. Stratified is when some populations or habitats can be separated into groups to sample. So for example, if you're sampling a pond, you might do stratified sampling, whereby you take a sample from the surface of the water, then a sample from shallow water, then a sample from deep water. And because you have split the pond into those regions and taken a sample from each region, that would count as stratified. Or it could be systematic, which is what these two pictures are showing, where you're using a belt transect. And we typically use systematic if you want to examine a change in the distribution of species within a habitat. And that's what we can see here, looking at going from the shore working 
backwards to see is there any difference in the species diversity perhaps or species richness um, as you move further away from the ocean. So a belt transect is when you replace a single tape measure along your sample area and either at every single distance or maybe set intervals you would place your quadrat and then you'd record the data in that quadrat. You should still do a large number of repeats though and that would mean placing your transect at multiple positions in parallel along the shore. So for both of those random and non-random examples we said you'd place a quadrat. So quadrats are used if you are sampling plants or slow moving organisms that couldn't move out of your quadrat before you collected the data. And you could use a point quadrat, which is simply a horizontal bar with holes along it. And at set intervals, there is a pin that's placed through. The pin is pushed through to touch the ground and any species that touches the pin only is recorded. The one that you're probably more familiar with is a frame quadrat, which is normally 0.5 by 0.5 meters in dimension. And it could have grids or it might be completely open. Here is now a 2025 spec edit to make sure this is really marked scheme specific. A point quadrat is a horizontal bar with holes along it, but you need to state in the exam that for a frame quadrat, it is a square frame. So you need to state it is a square. When you place your quadrats, there are three different methods you could use to record the data. You could use density, and this is when you count all of the individuals present in that quadrat. So it might be your sampling daisies, so you'd count every single daisy within that quadrat. Frequency is much quicker, and this method requires a gridded frame quadrat with 100 squares ideally. And what you would do is count how many squares out of the 100 squares the species you're investigating in is present. And if the plant species was present in 25 out of the 100, we'd say you've got frequency of 25%. So for this one, it doesn't matter how much of an individual square is covered. It's just, is it present in an individual square or not? And that's how it differs to percentage cover. Percentage cover is where you estimate the percentage of the entire quadrat covered with the species that's been investigated. This is quick, but it can be quite subjective because you have to do your own estimate. But you can try and improve the accuracy of your estimate by standardizing how you decide one percentage. And a common way to do this is you would use 100 squares in your quadrat again you only count one square as one percent if at least half of that small square is covered by the plant. Now with animals that are faster moving we wouldn't use a quadrat because they can move out of it. So there are a range of different techniques that you could use which I'll put them all up here. Um, sweeping nets which we can see so you might sweep it through the air or through long grass. Pitfall traps where you put a trap to have insects fall into it. Pooters is where you create almost like a vacuum because you suck on one end of the straw and the other end you put over the insect and it sucks it into the examination tube. We've then got the Tulgrim funnel where you've got a light source and that causes insects to move away from the light and therefore into the bottle. And kick sampling would use in a river where you kick to disturb the mud at the bottom and therefore any invertebrates would move up in the water and you'd catch it in a net. Now, from all of these techniques, you could then count how many different species you have, and that'd be a way to measure species richness. So species richness is the number of different species present, and sampling methods, as we just said, could be used to record that. But if you want to know species evenness, you would have to record how many different species are present, but also count the number of individuals present in each species. Because species evenness is the idea of, do you have um, a relatively equal amount of individuals in different species? The increase in the human population has had a huge impact on biodiversity. And that's because there will be increased agriculture that is needed. And we are driving climate change to happen at a faster rate. So the human population is continually increasing at an exponential rate. And humans need space for housing, we need farming for food, and there'll be needs for industry. 
and all of those require deforestation. And deforestation is going to be removing habitats and food sources. Agriculture is needed to feed everyone, but you need to clear land for agriculture, which yet again results in the destruction of habitats and food sources. There might also be chemical pesticides and fertilizers being used, which can affect organisms. And there might be monocultures that are being grown, meaning just one type of species, like we can see here. And that in itself reduces the biodiversity. Climate change, in particular this increase in global temperatures, is melting polar ice caps and therefore destroying habitats. It's also resulting in sea levels rising, which is reducing biodiversity due to the flooding that can occur. And these higher global temperatures and lower rainfall also means some plants and animals are unable to survive in their habitats anymore. Xerophytes are becoming the dominant species in some areas because those are plants that are adapted to very dry conditions and therefore they're able to outcompete other plants to survive in those harsher abiotic conditions. So why this matters then and why we should try and maintain biodiversity is if an ecosystem experiences a loss in biodiversity is a cause of concern because it indicates a change is causing the loss of habitats, Therefore, death and extinction of species is often to follow. And this reduction in biodiversity is undesirable for ecological, economical and aesthetical reasons. So the ecological reasons are if you're removing habitats, all organisms are interdependent on each other. So if you think about the food chain, if you take out one individual, it has a knock on effect on all of the organisms in the food chain. And therefore, it will have an impact eventually on humans running out of food. The economical reasons is that deforestation can result in soil erosion and monocultures can result in soil becoming deficient in particular minerals and the crop absorbs lots of the minerals that are there. Now, both of those result in depletions and negatively impact a country's ability to grow crops. Also, tourism relies on people visiting areas of natural beauty, observing animals in their natural habitat. So the extinction of these habitats, plants and animals might result in less tourism and therefore less money coming into the country. Another reason is medicines have been based on chemicals naturally occurring in plants. So if plants are going extinct, potentially the molecules needed to cure diseases will be lost forever. Lastly, we have the aesthetic reasons. And that's this idea that being in nature and around animals and plants enriches people's lives. And this is why many people choose to visit different environments like the rainforest and beaches. Nature is also a creative inspiration for art, music, writers, and being amongst nature has been shown to improve people's mental health also. So how can we then maintain biodiversity? It can either be done in situ, which means within the habitat, or ex situ, which means not within the habitat. Now, in situ conservation is actually really beneficial because it has other knock on effects. If you're going to be helping to maintain a habitat, all the organisms are interdependent on each other. So if you're putting measures in place in situ to prevent the extinction of one species, it's going to have a positive effect on all of the species in that area. So, for example, marine conservation zones and wildlife reserves are in situ methods of maintaining biodiversity. And marine conservation zones are designated for wildlife to recover and repopulate, for example, areas where fishing and tourism aren't allowed. Wildlife reserves are the same concept, but on land. So these areas are actively managed to conserve the wildlife. Ex situ involves removing organisms from their natural habitat to try and protect them. And it's usually used in addition to in situ measures. So for example, botanical gardens, seed banks and captive breeding. A wide range of plant species can be grown in botanical gardens and that provides them with an optimum condition for growth. Seed banks are like a store of genetic material. Seeds of a variety of plant species are stored in water and temperature controlled environments to keep them viable for longer. And they are stored as a backup for potential plant species if they happen to go extinct. And captive breeding involves reproducing animals in zoos and aquariums 
and the aim is to increase the number of endangered species and those individuals can then be reintroduced into the wild. You could also use international and local conservation agreements. And I'll list these here for you to be aware of. It is quite a lot of text, this one, and just facts that you need to remember. So I'm going to put all of it up. You can screenshot and turn each of these into a flashcard or make your own notes on this topic. Next, we move on to classification and evolution. The first type of classification we're going to look at is phylogenetic classification. And this arranges species into groups according to their evolutionary origins and relationships. And it tells us how closely related species are and how recent their shared common ancestor is, which means the species they have evolved from. And it's often represented in these phylogenetic trees where we are looking at present time, moving back in time. And every time you've got a branch, this indicates there was a common ancestor here and in this example, humans and chimpanzees evolved from this common ancestor. So that is the most recent common ancestor for humans and chimpanzees. And because in terms of back in time, it's relatively recent, that means humans and chimpanzees are closely related. If we were to compare that to going further back in time to this first common ancestor that we see for all of the species, at that point, we have a branch and then another branch to get to the penguins. This shows us that humans and penguins are very distantly related because their last common ancestor is a very long period ago in time. And we don't have a scale, but that would be millions of years ago they evolved from a common ancestor. Another way to classify is using this Linnaeus classification hierarchy system where we have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And each of these groups is called a taxa or taxon for singular. And this is known as a hierarchy because we have smaller groups arranged into larger groups and there's no overlap between the groups. Now, what that means is members of different species, which is a smaller group, can fit into the same genus, which is a larger group but there'll be no overlap between those different species, even though they're in the same genus. The binomial system is universally used so that data on different species can be used. And binomial means two names. And the two names that are used are the first name, which is the genus, and the second name, which is the species. So our common species name is humans, but our scientific or binomial system name is Homo sapiens because Homo is the genus that we're in and species is the sapiens. And we can see that here for these two types of birds. We've got the common name and then you've got the binomial system that is used for the genus and the species. And this is helpful because common names can be misleading because they first will be different in every language and secondly they're normally based on physical appearance whereas the binomial system gives you an indication of how closely related different species are because if there are different species but the same genus they must be closely related. So in terms of the conventions of how you present this in the binomial system you always have to write the genus with a capital letter and the species with a lowercase so we've got a capital H lowercase s and when it's on a computer, so it's word processed, it has to be in italics to make it stand out as a name. Now, if you're doing this handwritten, because you can't tell the difference between something in italics or not, because everyone's handwriting, instead, if it's handwritten, you would do each word underlined. Within that hierarchy classification system, the second taxa down after domain was kingdom. And you need to know all five. We've got the prokaryote, the protoctista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. And you've got here some descriptions to tell you what the classification of each is based on. So this could be a good set of five flashcards. There have been changes in the classification systems though, as there's been advances in technology, because classification used to be based on physical appearances. And that could be really misleading because Members of the same species can look very different if they live in different habitats or members of different species can look very similar if they live in the same habitat. And that's because they'd be exposed to similar environmental conditions and therefore evolved to have similar adaptations. So the accuracy of classification improved a lot 
when we had advances in genome sequencing and immunology to be able to compare our molecular similarities and not just observable characteristics. So some of these changes in classification systems include comparing DNA base sequences. So a common gene across different species would be selected and the DNA base sequence for that gene would be compared. The more closely related the species is, the more similar that DNA base sequence would be. And that is because different species can't reproduce together and therefore they can't share their DNA. So every species will have random mutations that occur. Those mutations accumulate over time and that's what makes your DNA base sequence different. So the longer ago in time that a species evolved from a common ancestor, that would mean there's been more time to accumulate more mutations and therefore your DNA would be more different. Whereas closely related species would have evolved from a common ancestor more recently and therefore had less time to accumulate mutations and their DNA base sequence would be more similar. Comparing the sequence of amino acids is the same concept, but instead of comparing the number of DNA bases in exactly the same order, you compare the number of amino acids for a common protein and see how many amino acids are exactly the same. And you can do that because the sequence of amino acids is determined by the DNA base sequence. However, that method won't be as accurate because the genetic code is degenerate, which means some of those amino acids might be coded for by different codons. Now, due to these advances in how we classify, Carl Vos proposed a change to the classification system in 1977, and he actually introduced an extra taxa above kingdom, which is domain. And in the 1990s, three domains were added to the classification system. We then had the domains archaea, bacteria, and eukaryota. And organisms are split into those three domains based on the type of RNA and ribosomes they have and the cell membrane structures they have. So under this system, there are actually six kingdoms because the prokaryota kingdom is split into eubacteria, which is the true bacteria, and archaea bacteria. Eubacteria are found everywhere and most bacteria fall within that kingdom. The archaea bacteria live in extreme environments such as thermal hot springs and anaerobic environments. Just to quickly interrupt here to make you aware, I've added some extra details to this slide for the OCR 2025 specification to make sure it's now really marked scheme specific. So if you're going to be writing notes, make sure you're using this version of the slide rather than the previous one, even though the explanation is still fine, this has got a little bit extra detail on it. Natural selection is the process that leads to evolution. And initially this was proposed by Wallace in 1858, and he submitted his ideas to Darwin to be peer reviewed. Darwin was aboard the HMS Beagle prior to this, conducting his own studies into this theory. And this is where we get the idea of Darwin's finches on each Galapagos Island, in that he noticed that the finches on each island had different shaped beaks, and this was reflected by the different food present on those islands. Now he proposed that based on the environment, certain features were being passed on. And as Wallace's ideas were so similar to Darwin's, they worked together to publish scientific journals in 1958. And later Darwin independently published on the origin of species in 1856. Darwin's theory was very controversial and it wasn't widely accepted as it went against the current societal beliefs and religious beliefs. However, it is now widely accepted due to evidence and that evidence is fossil, DNA and molecular evidence. So fossils are imprints or remains of dead animals and plants and rocks from a long time ago. And fossils help to support the theory of natural selection and evolution in a range of ways. The fossil records provide evidence of how species have changed over time and how species have evolved. And also they show how species were far more simple many millions of years ago. By comparing DNA base sequences of common genes or other molecular evidence, such as RNA base sequences or amino acid sequences, we can also examine how closely related different species are. And this has enabled scientists to estimate 
the point in history when two species shared a common ancestor. Cytochrome C is a protein found in the mitochondria, which a large number of species have, so it's normally the gene for cytochrome C, or that protein, that is compared. Evolution results in a species that is better adapted to its environment, and adaptations can be classified as either anatomical, physiological, or behavioural. And anatomical adaptations are internal or external physical features. Behavioural adaptations are changes in the way organisms act. These could be genetic in cause or learnt from parents. And physiological adaptations are processes that take place within an organism. Organisms from different taxonomic groups may have similar anatomical adaptations. For example, marsupial mould and the placenta mould. This is due to convergent evolution. And this is when different species are exposed to similar similar selection pressures, or in other words, environmental conditions. And that means they'll undergo natural selection for similar alleles and they'll become more genetically similar. So there are different types of variation. We have intraspecific and interspecific variation. And these differences or variations between members of different species is called interspecific variation. This is the widest type of variation and could be differences in feeding mechanisms, the number of legs, fur or hair, or much more. Differences between members of the same species is intraspecific variation, and genetic variation within the same species is introduced through mutations, crossing over and independent assortment in meiosis, sexual reproduction and random fertilisation. Environmental factors can also cause variation. The environment has a greater impact on plants though, and that's because they cannot move and therefore they're always exposed to those environmental conditions. Some examples of variation in humans created solely by environmental factors include tattoos, piercings and scars. And we can classify this variation as either continuous or discontinuous. Continuous variation refers to traits that are controlled by many genes and the environment can have an impact. This is represented graphically using a histogram. Discontinuous variation refers to traits that are controlled by a single gene and the environment has no impact. Therefore, individuals fit into a particular category and this is represented by a bar chart. We've got blood group as our example for discontinuous variation, petal length for continuous. So how natural selection results in these adaptations and this variation then We've already said that natural selection is the process that leads to evolution. Evolution is the change in the allele frequency over many generations in a population. And natural selection is really important because it results in species becoming better adapted to their environment. And we've already said that the adaptations could be anatomical, physiological or behavioural. So here's the process. And if you did have a long answer question linked to this, these would be your key marking points. Marking point number one and step one in the process is random mutations occur within a population. Second mark is that introduces genetic variation to the population. Third marking point would be along the idea is that while some mutations are harmful, sometimes new alleles created by mutations provide an organism with an advantage to survive in that particular environment. Conditions within the environment which drive natural selection are called selection pressures. And that's one of your key terms. And examples of selection pressures might be competition for resources or the introduction of new diseases, new predators, or even changes to the climate. The next step then is that that new allele will provide a reproductive selective advantage. Basically, that means the individuals with that allele are more likely to survive and therefore reproduce and pass that allele onto their offspring. These individuals have that reproductive success. Number five, then over many generations, there will be an increase in the frequency of that particular allele within that population. And then finally, it's stating that evolution would have occurred because evolution is a change in the allele frequency of a population. So some examples of natural selection include antibiotic resistance, and that has resulted in bacteria evolving to become resistant to antibiotics. And if we apply this to that process of natural selection, a random mutation would have occurred and it created an allele that provided resistance to an antibiotic within that bacterial population.
if this population is then exposed to that antibiotic, which it's now resistant to, and that would count as the selection pressure, only those bacteria with the resistance allele will survive and the others will die. That then means that they can replicate and therefore that allele is passed on over many generations and it results in most of the bacteria in that population carrying that allele. The overuse and widespread use of antibiotics is what has increased the rate of antibiotic resistance developing. And using antibiotics for viral infections, minor bacterial infections and not completing the course of antibiotics have all contributed to this. Another example is pesticide resistant insects. They have also evolved following the introduction of pesticides instead of antibiotics this time. And that is to protect the crops in a similar way. And this has led to farmers needing to use more toxic pesticides and in higher quantities, which is having a negative impact in terms of reducing biodiversity. So that takes us to the end of module four. Hope you found it helpful. If you did, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe and stick around for all of my weekly videos.